Hey everyone, I'm Meg and I'm here with some really special guests today. We're so excited to have a really candid conversation about conservatorship reform and abolition and how they can work together. Uh, I'm joined here by Richard Calhoun and Linda Kincaid from the Coalition for Elderly and Disability Rights, which is commonly known as CEDAR. CEDAR was formed in direct response to civil rights violations and crimes against conservatives and has been instrumental in conservatorship reform in the state of California for many years. We are so excited to have you both with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's go ahead and dig right in. Okay. The first thing I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, just to hear a little bit about your personal stories and how you became aware of this issue to begin with. Uh, that was my fault. My mom got kidnapped. And so when, when somebody gets kidnapped, you think you're supposed to go to the police. And so we did that. And that didn't work out so well. The police that were actually helping the kidnappers. So when police don't help, then you think you should go to civil court. So I went and hired an attorney. I did lots of research and I found this really highly recommended, what was he, uh, certified, elder, elder certified elder law attorney. Um, like the only one in the area where my mom was. And we went to see him and he says, oh, well, you, you need to petition for conservatorship over your mother. And if, if you file for conservatorship, you'll get to see mom again. Like, okay, you know, write out a check, sign the documents, let's do this. And things dragged on and on and on. And the court appointed the kidnapper as the conservator rather than me. And the kidnapper continued isolating my mom. And, you know, initially I was really relieved thinking, okay, she's been appointed conservator. There are all these laws about conservatorship. The court is overseeing this. She'll be required to follow the law. Finally, I was so wrong. The court did not help at all in any way whatsoever, provided no oversight at all. It was just a feeding frenzy of attorneys bickering back and forth and back and forth and back and forth like a bunch of gerbils on exercise wheels running up billable hours. And my mom had a million dollars, so that pays for quite a few uh, billable hours to attorneys. Yeah, absolutely. And Thank then you, my Richard. involvement was obviously through her. So that's yeah, I, I, I dragged him into the mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well how, how did it go ahead, Linda? Sorry. I think, well, while I was at home having a nervous breakdown, he was up in Sacramento, walking the halls in Sacramento, talking to legislators, meeting with the FBI, doing everything that we could imagine to do. And of course, none of that led to anything. And we kept on walking the halls in Sacramento and managed to get some legislation passed. In fact, the, the first bill in California that guarantees the conservatives right to visitation was passed in 2013 because of my mother. You know, Governor wow. Brown signed it two days after my mom passed away. Wow, that gave me chills all over my body. That is incredible work. These stories are just so gut-wrenching and awful. And the fact that they're happening, you know, right here is just, you. it should be shocking, like, but it's, it's not because it's happening so often. Well, it is um, shocking, but nobody knows about it. You know, and that's one yeah. thing that Free Britney movement has done that's been a huge plus is it's mm -hmm. getting the issue in front of the general public. Because when we started this, everybody looked at us like we were crazy. And now sure. telling the same fact pattern, everybody is now saying, yeah, we're hearing this a lot. We're hearing this a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's just in 11 years. Yeah, yeah. it changed dramatically. Um, like Richard said, in the beginning, nobody would believe us. And that's part of the reason I'm using our deposition videos to create documentary films is that nobody will believe us. And so I'm using the video of the people who did these things in their own words, under oath, talking about what they did. You know, so yeah. it's not me on camera saying a certain thing happened. It's now the people who did it on camera saying what they did. And I felt I needed to do that to show that Yes, it really did happen. I didn't imagine it. I didn't make it up. Yep. At this point, there are so many other stories. And, you know, Richard made a good point that Free Britney has really changed the landscape. Nobody would believe this was real. Um, I think part of what a lot of us go through emotionally is we can't believe this is really happening in America. Like I said, I graduated from Berkeley. 
I was spoon fed civil justice on a daily basis. Yeah. And the idea that my mom could be kidnapped and the police would help the criminals was basically just my, I couldn't get my brain around that. It was like it was short circuiting my brain. I couldn't accept that this was happening, not just in the U S but in California. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> Truly shocking. Well, speaking of California, can you, so how did your involvement with your mom's case lead to forming um, Cedar? And what are some of the things that you're most proud of that you guys have accomplished to date, aside from the one that you've already mentioned? Well, Cedar happened because you need to be an organization if you want to talk to the legislators from any place else than your own district. And our own district was <coughs> completely non-receptive. Yeah, our two, you know, our, our state senator, our state assembly member were non-responsive to put it politely so we needed to talk to somebody else but they always say well go back and talk to your own representatives from your own district but if you're an organization you've got access to everybody in the capitol building so we made up an organization and that's what i recommend everyone else do you know get three of your best friends together and create an organization and now you've got access to everybody in sacramento or people in other counties and That's very cool. Something the thing that I'm probably the most proud of uh, actually stemmed from our experiences with law enforcement. Uh, this was something that took, I don't think it was five years to actually get isolation defined in the penal code. Yeah, but, you know, we started in 13, so I would yeah. actually say close to uh, six or seven, seven yeah. years, six I mean, years. And I, I think what we did is a great example of how you make little incremental changes that add up. You know, this all would have stopped back in 2010 if the deputy who was investigating our report had intervened and said, hold it, you can't grab a little old lady and lock her up. That's just not okay. You're violating this lady's rights. You gotta let her go. You know, yep. if the deputy had just, you know, that simple thing, none of what came later would have happened and you and I wouldn't be here talking today. Yeah. So we wanted law enforcement to understand that isolating someone, denying them visitation is a crime. Well, in the penal code, you've got penal code 368, talks about elder abuse and it talks about mental suffering, but it really doesn't define that not letting someone have visitors is abuse. Now you and I might say, it should be pretty obvious that if I took you and locked you up someplace and never let you see anyone ever again, that it might cause some mental suffering. You know, I, I think it might, but yep. you know, the cops don't seem to quite make that connection. It's like, oh, well, she's old. So, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. So incrementally piece by piece, we have now got isolation into the penal code along with a definition of what isolation is. The idea that simply not allowing someone to have contact with the outside world is a crime and it's finally in the penal code. And that happened as of January 1st this year, the, the final version that we're happy with. But it took years to get it there, little, little piecemeal, little bit by bit by bit. And we finally got the pieces we wanted there. And it actually started back in 2014 with a junior college intern <laughs> yeah, program right. that yes. you, Linda was doing as she was going through paralegal school. So, you know, and that was just, you know, request of information and stumbled in Lexipool. So starting in you know, December of 14 and then January 15, I tried to engage in Lexipool and they're a private company that does policies for fire department, police department, uh, incarceration, probation, juvenile detention across the nation. And they don't know what they're doing and they have no public input. So these public agencies that impact everybody's life is being done by this company and now out of Texas called Lexipol LLC. And, you know, it's absurd. I mean, that's probably the biggest impact on us and we have no impact. They worry only about the legal liability of their agency, not good policing policies. So we as a society might be willing to pay a higher price for law enforcement if law enforcement was balanced 
All they're worried about is financial payouts during litigation. So they're all about minimizing liability. So for example, and this is just a made up example, use of force, they may instruct their officers to unload their weapon to be able to document they were really afraid of their life versus doing one shot to take the person down to def defuse the situation. So that's the kind of difference that every day is impacting everybody's life and nobody pays attention to it. They're in 35 states and in California, they're 95% of the law enforcement agencies. Wow. So by getting it legislated <clears throat> that these certain things must be in law enforcement policies, now Lexapol has to do that for California. Wow. And you know, and I, I having come from being a safety consultant, I was well aware how policies drive what happens. And you know, every company has we, we, we joke about the white binders on the shelf. That's where all the policies are. They're in the white binders on the yep. shelf. And they may be followed more or less, you know, it's, 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 it's aspirational. Yep. But, but you tend to find and when something goes wrong, and if you're in litigation, and if you're meeting the standard that is in those policies, those white binders on the shelf, if you meet that, that standard, you're probably going to be okay in litigation. But if your policy says you needed to do three times better than you did, and you didn't meet your own policy, you're probably going to lose in court. So unfortunately, one of the things we would advise companies is set your policy just at the OSHA requirement or very slightly above. You know, We would have these idealistic new companies that wanted to do great things and put all these great protective measures in place and say, great, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of protecting your people but don't write it into your formal policy or else you will be held to that in court. Wow. I mean, which is, you know, as a safety consultant, you want to push the company to do better, but I also realized that a really strong protective policy could backfire on them if they're ever in litigation, which of course you assume everybody ends up in litigation sooner or later. Yeah. In this so that's what we have the approach that we took with the, the law enforcement policies in California was requiring the policy to be improved. Yep. So now if a cop doesn't follow that policy, his department can be sued. But to give you some incremental steps in between that, we started with a junior college uh, paralegal project. Then we went to city council and board of supervisors meeting trying to get the local cop manuals fixed. That was a dead end. So we filed this great civil grand jury complaint that then came up and really beat up the San Jose PD. So in 2015, the San Jose PD, which is what the third largest state uh, city in the, uh, California, came out with probably the best elder abuse policy in the state. And then we were starting to use that policy they came up with at the state level and writing it into the policy. So that was, those are the incremental steps that went on in the process because we learned a lot. In fact, it was fairly recently we were, learned that AB 937, the 2013 bill on visitation, we only include probate general conservatorships. We didn't include limited conservatorships. So they still don't have the right for visitation if you're on a limited conservatorship. Yeah, because at the time we didn't know about that. Now in the future, we'll try to do both of those in parallel. But when we were doing that, we were just, we were thinking about probate conservatorship, older people isolated from their kids mostly. Yeah. And we weren't thinking the flip side of it of younger people who are isolated from their parents because yeah. we hadn't had those experiences yet. I think that's one thing that can be so frustrating. And I'm obviously, you know, speaking to two people who have done a ton of incremental change. And I'm sure that it's been a lot of long days and hours. And, but I think, I think, you know, it's something that people get frustrated with when a new bill gets signed into law and part of it is good, but a lot of it is kind of, you know, just okay, or it doesn't go far enough. And so like, like Brad Lund recently with AB 1194, he was talking about how, you know, this is, it's certainly no silver bullet. It doesn't have, um, it doesn't protect the victims and their families because there's a lack of court oversight that's really needed. And so I guess, how do you guys push through that and how do you look at this incremental change and watch it build over time and you know what how, how does that process look like what does that process look like for you guys 
Well, in 1194, I'll throw out right off the bat, yes, it's not a silver bullet, but at the same time, the attorney of choice and a zealous advocate, which is in 1194, will be huge because now you'll have an attorney on your side. You know, so people now should, when they doing their estate planning, it should be who do they want to represent them? Should there be a conservatorship down the road? And then that person comes in and advocates for them. The right now, the court appointed attorneys are probably the biggest problem in the state of California. So yeah. it's not an inclusive silver bullet, but there is a pretty major aspect. And frankly, when you get through it and read it, the vast majority of the sections are subject to funding. And so one of the projects I want to do for next year is decide what aspects do I want to fund and which aspects do I want to not fund. And part of my concern is one of the things in there that requires funding is explaining to the conservative his rights under current law. So they actually regressed if, if they don't have to do that any longer without specific funding. So, but you have to balance, is the needle moving in the right direction, not moving at all or moving in the wrong direction? And then, you know, even if it's incremental, it's gonna be a whole lot easier to go in and say, we want funding for section six. We want section funding for section nine versus doing this. And some of the sections actually go all the way back to 2006. So that's gonna be sort of my big leverage point is, California passed these bills in 2006, and yes, they were mirrored in 1194, but you haven't funded it. And we just went through last year a $40 billion surplus, and we couldn't do 10 or $20 million to protect the conservatives in the state. That speaks volumes for where the priorities are. Yep. Yeah, I was going to bring up the surplus too. Do you so when you're having these conversations about funding, like how does the process work? What kinds of, who are you talking to and what kind of conversations are you having? It's all new. We've never done funding before. <laughs> we've okay. done, that's new for, we've, we've got a lot of bills passed saying thou shalt do this. We've never yet said thou shalt fund this. And that's in fact, my understanding is the governor comes out with his bill in his um, budget in January. So right now is when they're doing the budget. So one of my calls and follow up on Monday, Tuesday is to the people that I think will be receptive. Hey, how do I go and request mm -hmm. funding for these things? And I'll start with Lowe's office since he wrote the bill. But, you know, one of the bill things in there actually doubles up the accounting. You now would have to do an accounting every six months and annually. That is actually increasing the cost of the conservatorship. We would actually oppose that. And yep. back in 2006, that was about two thirds of the cost. So if we just eliminate that part and ignore mm -hmm. it, the other costs become pretty insignificant. In fact, I in 2006, I believe the number was 4.9 million. And even if you triple it, you're only talking about 15 million. And what I find incredulous is the court that has no idea how many cases they are, it comes up with a budget on what it's gonna cost them. So if you have don't have any idea of how many times you do something, how can you come up with a budget? Right. Yeah, the court doesn't even have a clue how many conservatives there are. So their budget numbers are pulled out of thin air. Yeah, I mean, I think that's all across America as well, that we just have no idea, A, how many people are in conservatorships, and B, how many are in abusive conservatorships. But I do want to back up a little bit to your original question about the incremental changes, and we need to not throw out the good looking for the perfect. Yeah. And no legislation is ever going to be perfect because you've got pushback from the other side. We have TexCom, the Trust of the States Committee, Committee of the Bar, yep. Trust of the States section of the bar, opposing the idea of a conservative having counsel of choice. Yep. They actually came out with a letter opposing that concept, as hard as that is to believe. So when you're trying to do something progressive to protect people and you have an industry that is so incredibly lucrative, th they don't want to lose their billable hours. This is, right. these guys have got German cars that they have to pay for. You know, they've got mansions to pay for. <laughs> and the hard part is finding a legislator that's willing to introduce the bill. Yep. And if it's complex, the number of the willing to do it go way down. And then if you get opposition, you either have to amend the bill and if they came out for one part of it, they're more likely to attack another part. Because I look at seven, eight, SB 724 this year, it did two major things, Council of Choice and Zealous Advocates. Council of Choice probably would have flown through 
now it's included in AB 1194, so we don't have to worry about it. Zealous right. advocates is what got people upset and moved, you know, derailed mm -hmm. it to a two-year bill. But now we have a slot open for next year. Same thing with S, uh, AB 1062. It did two things. 15-day notice for getting rid of valueless property and conservatives that are trustees have, are under court supervision. It was the 15 day notice that derailed that bill because they argued they didn't know what valueless property was. But that term has already been in the probate code for decades. So it's already defined by practice. So, you know, it's a red herring. So that's the problem with doing a comprehensive bill is something that's might they find something that they can lock their teeth into and derail the whole thing. And I think the reason we were successful on you know, some of the things we accomplished and, you know, I'll, I'll hold up the cop manual definition of isolation as, as a big one. If we had tried to do that in one fell swoop in one bill, there is no chance it would have gone through. But by doing it in three or four little pieces incrementally, it just kind of slid under the radar. Nobody got upset about it. We mostly had support, sometimes unanimous support, and it went into effect. And next year we bite off another little piece. And those little pieces yeah. add up. I, when you talk about changing language to say zealous advocate, which just seems like it should be a no brainer, but um, it was something that Texcom and others got really upset about. But if we don't have court oversight to actually enforce someone being a zealous advocate, how does it impact? Like, does it actually help people? Or is it like just a, a piece of the journey, you know? Um, it is a piece of the journey. I don't really hold out a lot of hope for court oversight ever, okay. just because bureaucracies tend toward the mediocre and you, you don't find innovation coming out of bureaucracies. I think it's groups like yours that drive things to happen. Social um, change social, you know, courts are probably the last thing to change. Uh, yeah. Law is, is slow to change, not quite as slow as the courts. What changes is groups like yours changing social thought, changing people's perspectives. You know, 10 years ago, nobody would have understood what we were talking about. Even two years ago, I think it would have been a difficult conversation. We started noticing changes in court behavior about June of 2020. And I don't know if that was because of COVID and hearings were going virtual and now anyone could click into any hearing anywhere in California, mm -hmm. or if it was because Free Brittany was starting to get active and starting to get people wondering what is going on? What is this conservatorship thing? So we started yeah. seeing changes beginning a, a little over a year ago. And I would say when the media really started getting involved was after June of 21. And we all know why the media suddenly jumped into it June 21. And, but you know, those aren't things that came out of the legislature. That didn't come from court oversight. Yeah. That came from people like us, people like you having our eyeballs on it, raising questions, talking about it, just poking it with a stick. Yeah. And that discussion. I think is what shines a light on it and makes a change. And then along the way, the legislators go, oh, well, yeah, of course we want to fix this. And somewhere along the way, the judges will decide that they want to do things differently. And then they'll take credit for it all. And, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but when you go back to just break that down, if you have attorney of choice, now the court appointed attorneys start losing their authority and their nut, you know, their net on conservatorship in the probate code. So if there's more counsel in there, you have less opportunity for the old boys club, old girls club to happen that currently happens. Yeah. yeah. Going back to the zealous advocacy, that's actually very controversial in California of itself. Most states have zealous advocacy as the model that the attorney is supposed to represent. That is not in the bar code of ethics. So now they were putting that in to probate code when we've kept it out of the bar code of ethics. And so that's why that part got pushed back so much. So, you know, 
it wasn't that they, they've been successful in keeping the zealous advocacy out of their responsibility across the field. So they don't want it popping up anywhere else. But I think it's mostly being able to divide up the workload that you won't see the abuse, the widespread abuse that we currently see. Well, and I, I think uh, the Brittany case really brought it home for everyone. You know, like if we'd had this conversation a year ago about counsel of choice, zealous advocacy, most people would have blazed over. But yeah. when we heard Brittany say, <clears throat> you know, talking to the judge, and I'm sorry, ma'am, I didn't know I could petition to terminate. Like, and the world heard it. I know. I just, it was, it was so. Um... You know, we'd been fighting this fight for a while and we knew that we were right and we had proof that we were right. But um, to hear Brittany say some of the things that she said in her words and to also talk about the fact that there are thousands of abuse of conservatorships and it was just really cool. But I'm thinking this is 13 years. This guy has been paid from her estate. I don't know how many millions of dollars. Yeah, he's been paid from her estate and she didn't know she had the right to petition to terminate. Nope, even though yes. she'd asked for it time and time yes. again. But yep. asking wasn't good enough. She needed to do a petition and she, right. her attorney did not inform her of the steps right. she needed to take. Well, he wasn't doing his job very well, was he? <laughs> he and was now well. the entire world knows. I know. And I, I think that's what changed the landscape. It's like, you know, when a, someone can be under conservatorship for 13 years, someone who is quite functional, apparently quite bright, and doesn't know that there is a path out of this thing that she's in where she doesn't want to be, the fault falls to her attorney. Yep. I agree. Totally. And even the court investigator that, in my opinion, should have explained to Brittany what her rights were. That's but, his job, too. A court yeah. investigator is supposed to be explaining all that stuff. But now under AB 1194 they need to be get funded in order to have to explain that right, which I think is a step backwards. Gotcha. But it's an okay. opportunity for another discussion. Yep. You know, legislation so, is just an opportunity for discussions. It, it's a way to force a, a public discussion to happen on a topic that you want people to know about. So how do you determine, like, say um, a bill is proposed and you read it and you're just like, how do you determine if it's worth trying to pursue and trying to make better or if it's just a bad bill that's not going to you know be effective at all well you always try to work with the author when it's introduced and then you try to tweak it and then if they're not willing to do it then you decide is this one you're going to oppose you know because one of the things that we've learned in, in sacramento is there used to be support supported with amendments uh, neutral uh, oppose unless amended and oppose. And now they're basically either support or oppose. Mm -hmm. There's no other, th they've cut out three positions. So you have to decide whether it's bad enough that you want to oppose it. And we did that on, uh, I think two bills this year yeah. and one bill, they basically amended to our liking. So we, you know, ended up yeah, supporting I, it. I had written a letter of opposition and they changed it and I flipped and I wrote a letter of support. And the wow. uh, that one got way late in uh, appropriation. The other one that we went to the mat on, we were going to lose and we lost, except it got way late in appropriations. Now, whether our, we had any impact on it or not, who knows? But, you know, you're not going to win every fight. Right. So how then do you, how do you view reform and abolition and how they work together or do they? Yes, they work together. Um, there are more and more people every day, more legal scholars, more high-level advocates coming out, opposing conservatorship, guardianship as simply a flawed system that cannot work no matter what you do. And one of my advocate friends likes to say, you don't help someone by taking their rights away. Right. You know, Britney Spears' civil rights were taken away from her. How did that help her? You know, maybe she needed some kind of assistance along the way somewhere. A lot of us need help with a lot of things. I sure don't know how to change spark plugs or put a new roof on a house. I need assistance with some things. I get that assistance that I need. Right. I don't need my rights taken away because I can't change spark plugs. Yep. So, but the end, Something that I believe you were going to ask us about the Uniform Guardianship and Protective Proceedings Act. 
Yeah. Which is a really nice step going the right direction. What we need to do is slow the flow of bodies going into the system. That's something that we can do right now. We need to clean up some of these things that are just flat out wrong, like a person being in conservatorship for 13 years and her own attorney never even telling her what her legal rights were. That's just right. wrong. That needs fixed. Right. End goal for a lot of us is to get rid of it completely. But yeah. a really good step along the way. There are a lot of states, what is it, 10, 12 states now I have passed, 13. Uh, thir uh, maybe 13 states have passed laws recognizing supported decision making as an alternative. Yeah. I'd like to go further. There is the Uniform Guardianship and Protective Proceedings Act. This is the work product of probably about two dozen legal scholars, high level advocates who worked on this thing for two to three years. I was present in some of the hearings. These are people who were really, really trying to frame the best language possible. It's not a law, it's, it's a draft document that can be adopted by states. Right. But I'm looking at page 94, a court appointing a guardian must and things they have to do. They want clear and con convincing evidence that the needs of the respondent cannot be met by a protective arrangement instead of guardianship yep. or other less restrictive alternative, including appropriate supportive services, technological assistance, or supported decision-making. And that kind yeah. of wraps it all up. What I like about that is that it, um, they have a lot of focus on person-centered planning. So it feels like too much of the time, this is all just this bureaucratic process. People are lining their pockets with money. Like the, the one or two hearings of Brittany's that I was able to listen to during when the remote audio program was available. Um, I don't even know that her name was mentioned. I mean, and if it was, it was like once or twice. It was about attorney fees. Mm -hmm. It was about anything other than Brittany, the person. And so what I like about the guardianship, conservatorship, and other protective arrangements acts is that it really centers around the disabled person and what they can do instead mm -hmm. of what they can't do. Yeah. And it makes them like go through and check, yes, we tried this, yes, we tried this, yes, we tried this. So therefore a guardianship is likely necessary, but it definitely um, reduces the number of people who go into the system. And I think what you have to do is you have to take that sort of as your model, your aspirational goals, and then incorporate it into your current code because every state has their own code right. and do the incremental steps. You, at least in California, there's no way we'd ever get the Uniform Act passed, whole lock, stock, and barrel replacing the California probate code. And I'm not even sure that'd be a step forward because there's some things that California is pretty leading edge on. But you know, it, it has some very good points, and you sort of blend it in and apply it. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of advocates don't understand: is probate is a state organization and you have to attack it at the state level, you can go to the federal when they're impacting your federal civil rights. And right. that's a huge mm -hmm. discrepancy or difference that a lot of people just don't get. But yeah. on the other hand, California tends to lead the nation. If we can get something like this done in California, that could drive other states to do something similar. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I like that concept that before you can impose a conservatorship, you have to show that you've tried these other things. It has to actually be in your court documents. You know, we tried assistive technologies. We tried supportive decision making. And here's why those things didn't work. Now, of yeah. course, like, like anything you try to do, there will be predators who will find a way around it. But I think putting that into the language of the law, that you have to explain what else you tried first. Because so many right. of these conservatorship hearings are five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes long. You bring in a yep. petition, uh, somebody's uh, getting forgetful, they lost their car keys, they didn't make their water payment on time. Okay, so we, we need to take away all of their rights and lock right. them up and, and basically bleed their estate. Like, yep. no, what did you do to try to help them get their water payment paid? Did somebody come and say, oh, here, the neighbor can help you write out the checks? Yep. 
you know, yeah, you lost I your car keys. Did you have some sort of assistance? Well, if you're losing your car keys all the time, maybe you shouldn't be driving. But well, did you maybe find some other way to get the person from place to place so they exactly. can participate fully, even if they're starting to have some cognitive deficits? Right. Yep. I totally agree. I think, you know, I originally didn't really hear when I first entered into the movement, the only conversations I was hearing were about reform. And so as abolition kind of became more forefront, at least in the conversations I was having and the things I was reading, um, I, I was a little bit concerned for the fact that it didn't feel like it was something that could happen on a dime because there are so many people in the system who truly do have needs. So if we abolished it outright, I wasn't sure where that would leave them. And so I think it's been really interesting to hear your perspective about how reform should lead to abolishment. Yes, and I accept the reality that at least under the current system, once a person is in the system, it is very, very difficult to get out. And the people who are in the system now may not have any hope of getting out. You know, as much as we may disagree with that and think it's wrong, what happened to them, how they got there. Um, Brittany looks like she'll have a good chance, but she's got a lot going for her. Most people don't have the notoriety, the estate, the legal team. You know, I think Brittany will probably right. get out in time. Um, most people, it's gonna be, a really, really uphill battle to end most conservatorships. So what advocates are saying is what we can do right now is try to slow the flow. And yep. especially for younger people, the, the, the school to conservatorship pipeline where schools, regional centers, um, you know, educational support people are all saying, your kid's 17 and a half, you've got to get that petition into court. You've yep. got to have conservatorship over your kid. You know, yep. the sky is going to fall if you don't have conservatorship when they turn 18. Yep. And well, and I go ahead. They just, let's look at other ways. You know, what does your child really need? You know, yep. obviously the parent has been providing what their child needs up to 17 and a half. How about we just have you keep on providing what the child needs and they get to keep the rights? Yes. And yeah. They may not be fully functional as an adult at 18, but you know, at 25, at 30, they might be a lot more functional than they are at 18. Yeah. You know, I'm an 18 year old who really is ready to take on adult responsibilities. There aren't many of them, including us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know I sure wasn't, but that, you know, that was exactly my parents' um, situation. When my brother was 17, the school told him that they needed to get a conservatorship or in Oklahoma, it's called a guardianship. And, you know, in my brother's case, his uh, developmental disability is very severe. So I, I do think that it afforded my parents the uh, legal right to protect him and to ensure his quality of life. And um, in his situation, I feel like it has operated to his benefit because he truly wouldn't be able to feed, shelter, or clothe himself without it. And that wasn't something that was going to increase over time, but it definitely is a broken system that that's just what is expected, that my parents were just told to do it, that so many people are just told to do it. When I know a lot of people who have developmental disabilities who live independent lives that certainly shouldn't ever be worried about being put into a conservatorship. And there are legal instruments that most of us use to provide assistance for whatever we might need at some point in time. Most of us would have an advanced health care directive. Yeah. Most of us would have a power of attorney. Yeah. Say, so if I can't pay my bills, then I want Richard to take, to go into my account and pay my bills for me. Yeah. Most of us would have some sort of estate plan of what happens after I die. That might not apply to a person who has no income and no assets, but the advanced healthcare directive and the power of attorney could still be used. And people say, oh, well, but he doesn't have capacity to sign these things. Well, we see in probate court all the time, estate plans being completely changed, flipped upside down through what's called um, what do they call it? Substituted judgment. Substituted judgment. 
you know, when you go in and say, well, grandma didn't really mean what she has in her will that she signed with three witnesses back, you know, 10 years ago. She didn't really mean that. What she really meant was that I'm supposed to get everything. And the judge right. goes, okay, rubber stamp, here you go. New estate plan. Right. And it happens all the time. So if the courts can be used for substituted judgment to, to put in place documents that are to the detriment of the person. Yep. How about if we flip it around and if those probate attorneys who are so good at writing these things create some of these documents to help people where yep. your brother most likely has the ability to sort of express that he likes your mom and your dad. Yeah. So we might say that, oh, by, by his actions of smiling when somebody comes in the room, of communicating with them to the extent he is able, that indicates that he would like them to be his power of attorney and his yep. agent for health care. And we can yep. say, oh, you know, like his actions every day indicate that he trusts these people and he wants them to take care of him. Yep. And the court could say, okay, we are going to interpret that to mean that his parents get power of attorney and his parents are his health care direct uh, agents. And yep. then they've got the documents that they need in hand when they go to the hospital and the hospital says, hey, he's an adult, we need authority to be yep. able to provide medical care. They say, here's the advanced directive. We're his agents for healthcare. Yeah, and I love that. And that for the same reasons I was saying earlier, it centers the person. It's so important. Yes. And we don't do any of that currently in the current system. And it also minimizes the differences. Instead of saying, well, there's us, there's people like us who have certain yes. characteristics. And then there's them. Those are those, those other people have different, who have different characteristics. I like that we just say, how about if all of us use these instruments that you and I would accept are just the norm. Yep. And if somebody needs help getting those instruments in place, let's give them the assistance they need. Yeah, yeah, that's really a really great point. Um, how long do you guys think that it will take for us to get to a world where conservatorships have been either drastically reduced or abolished entirely. Wow. A lot, the, the abolishment is, the, you know, it's aspirational. That's going to be decades down the road. But, you know, reduced, we've seen it? things happen so fast the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Things are happening now that we didn't think we'd see in our lifetimes. Wow. You know, and I, I credit Free Brittany for 90% of it. You've, you've brought the conversation into the public. Uh, you know, almost every day I see another news story talking about conservatorship. And um, it's it also social media, you know. It, you know, it, I, you know actually, let me reminisce a little bit. Um, my friend Kathy and I uh, used to go hiking. And I remember Kathy, this was before my mom was kidnapped, back when I used to have a life and do other things. And I remember Kathy lamenting that she would never in her lifetime see same-sex marriage. You know, it's just, it's not gonna happen. And she's a few years younger than me. So Kathy would be in her fifties now. <clears throat> you know, she believed that never in her lifetime would same-sex marriage be available to her and her friends. Mm -hmm. And now it's ancient history. That changed almost overnight in social terms. When we got to a tipping point of enough stodgy old people dying off and enough <laughs> young people like my niece coming of age and going, well, why shouldn't they be able to get married? I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> Chanel was just like, well, I have friends who are gay. Why shouldn't they be able to get married? You know, she just couldn't even understand what the conversation was even about. Yeah. So that has happened in our lifetimes that this what seemed like would never ever happen is just like now we're like well yeah of course what's what's the big deal right so things can change dramatically really quickly and this era of social media and this era of millennials and younger being very socially active yeah i think our yeah. generation focused on the german cars your generation is focusing more on social justice and yeah. you guys are changing the world thank you well thank and, you and, and I just I want to say real fast. Make, sorry. I just, I, no, you're fine. I just said, I just want to say real fast because I do appreciate you all giving some of the credit to Free Britney, but without organizations like Cedar and people like you, 
you know, we wouldn't have the foundation that we have. And it's been incredible getting to work with you guys. Well, we it, it goes together. You know, we're the geeks doing the geeky stuff. <laughs> we may never be any good at social media, but if we can provide information that you can then get out to the public, I think that's the, the that's the perfect collaboration. You know, you look for allies and collaborators who are different. Yeah. You know, you know, 20 clones of us probably wouldn't do a whole lot of good. <laughs> but you guys and us together, and now we're balancing each other. And Absolutely. You can take that concept with the social media and do things and educate the public. For yep. example, you know, everybody should have the healthcare directives and the power of attorneys and all those kinds of things, but they probably don't do things that I would recommend and this is a lay person talking, not an attorney advice, update it every year, even if there's no change. Because what we see time after time is the gap between when it was written and going into court, life changed, and that's what they use to leverage and alter it. So if you have this document that was written a decade ago, but every year you say, these are the changes I want, I want no changes. And every year on your birthday or whenever you sign it, and say it's the same document, that document is a whole lot stronger now when you need it. They That's tell fine. you to name your successor uh, trustees and your successor conservators and things like that in your documents. Uh, this came out of Danny Reed here in San Jose and modified by me. If it's someone that's unnamed in my document, they get paid minimum wage. That eliminates all the sharks. Imagine if Britney's people that aren't named in her document were getting paid minimum wage. <laughs> they wouldn't be there any longer. Right. So there's things that we can do right now to make yourself a non-attractive target. Something as simple as don't list the assets in your financial document. List it as an exhibit and keep that exhibit away from the financial document. You know, so there's steps that we can do under the current thing to make the system the way it is currently being abusive, less successful. And that would be huge too. Yeah, that, I hadn't really thought about some of that. We might have to do another video about that. That sounds awesome. Um, is there anything else you guys would like to add? This has been such a great conversation. Oh, we're gonna be thinking about our legislative session coming up very, very soon. Uh, if the legislators have gone home, they're back in district, now is the perfect time for everyone all over California to go talk to their legislators in their district offices, because they'll be having all kinds of events. I've done wonderful things for you in Sacramento. I'm so important, you know, send me more money. <laughs> well, get out there and say, we want you to fix some things. And yeah. then come what just a couple of weeks from now you're going to be contacting sacramento i'm contacting him next week and i'd love to get agreement from free britney on what they want to support but you know the january budget you know the governor has to have the january budget how many things on 1194 do we want to fund a week or two later than that i'm going to be rolling out my 2022 legislative cycle and there's some stuff left over from last year for the first time you know, like SB 724, uh, 10, 6, AB 1062, and then what, what are the top issues? Because if, we, if all of a sudden Cedar and Free Britney agree on four things, those four things go higher up on the priority list and are much more likely to be successful. And frankly, you don't get, as an advocate, you don't get to pick what happens. You know, one of my conversations with Senator Wykowski's staff is a great example very supportive senator. He was, our, he's the one that did AB 937 for us. And it wasn't even for us, it was for his staff, but that's okay. Um, you know, and the only reason we know that is the language of my email late at night is in the, in the, in the bill. talking about the bill that established the conservatives' right to visitation. It really oh, was wow. a complete accident of Richard sending some snide email to a staffer, and that very language got put into the bill. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. But I think, well, things we're going to be looking for, of course, first thing is get get the governor's signature on AB 1194. Yep, and that and is- We that. know the bar is opposing the concept of attorney of choice. We know they oppose the, the zealous advocacy. So yep. 
We're trying to get everyone at this point just to hammer the governor, lots of emails and requesting his signature. Because yeah. that's something that's really important that people don't understand mm -hmm. is the bar, the um, judicial council, they have direct feed into the governor's office. So they right. could be opposing a bill and be completely radio yeah. silent on the surface. Yes. And the governor, you know, he's pretty cocky now based on the landslide on his recall vote. He's going to do what his supporters want. So that actually hurt uh, the chances of A being at 1194. So yeah. number one is, is get the governor's signature on that bill. Then okay. assuming it passes, then we want to get funding for the piece of it that would have court investigators actually talk to family. Yep rather than only talking to the petitioner for the conservatorship, which is right. the way it works now. Right. If, I, if I file a petition for conservatorship, the court investigator will take my information and relay that to the court as if it's fact. They don't talk to anybody else. Right. That needs fixed. Yep. And AB Although then you have some situations like Brittany's where I wouldn't want the court investigator talking to her family either because they <laughs> just be telling, you know, is they're benefiting too, but I understand. That's that. true. But her, but her boyfriend would be a yeah, person yeah. you interview with. You interview Brittany herself. Yeah. Because yeah. right now. Yeah, what a thought. Interview Brittany about what she wants. Now, isn't right. that a great idea? Yeah. <laughs> and and one of the things on that note that's a little bizarre, they talk about this needs funding, but every time they do an interview, they charge the estate money. Right. You know, right. I think everybody that's been in this would rather go from $600 fee to a $1,000 fee and have an interview versus $600 fee with no interview. Yep. <laughs> then the other thing that is high on my list, um, I know there are several organizations that are going to be working their legislative contacts, wanting a bill next year on supported decision making. Gotcha. I am hoping we can work together to sort of elevate that a little bit, not just support the decision making, but this part of the Uniform Guardianship Act that I've been talking about. Yep. Let's go beyond a bill that says, oh, supported decision making is great and we should allow people to do that if they want to. Instead, let's use this language that's already developed and yep. say, until you try these other things, you don't put somebody under conservatorship. You have to try them and you have to explain to the court how they didn't work. Yep. Then you can consider a conservatorship. I love that. One, one of the major bills that actually came out of Senator Hill's office, former Senator Hill's mm -hmm. office, was what we call the Conservative Bill of Rights, essentially. And it says if you don't follow the probate code on key protections, the conservatorship has ended in seven days. Because right now yes. the probate code says that a temporary conservatorship can only last 30 days, but yet they go on forever. They go they, for years. Because they right. don't put in the penalty that on the 31st mm -hmm. day or the 61st day, it's terminated. So basically this would be, you find the key provisions, and I think there's five of them. If any one of these due process issues is not followed, the conservatorship is terminated in seven days. Yeah, there are many, many places where you could tighten up loopholes once a conservatorship happens. I would like to focus on slowing the flow into the system. Yeah. You know, not that I want to write off people who are there now. Uh, they deserve justice. They deserve representation. Reality is it's going to be very challenging to help people who are already in a very broken system. But if we can slow the flow, cut off the money coming into the system, over time, that'll start to wind things down. Yeah. Oh, this is all really heavy stuff, but <laughs> thank you so much for what you're doing. <laughs> thank you for what you guys are doing. And thank you for talking to me. I think this has been just a really, um, you know, educational conversation. And like I said earlier, we're really grateful to work with you guys. I mean, you guys are young folks with careers and families and, and social lives, and you still take time out to help someone that you never even met. And I think that's just really fantastic. I hope that we can help a lot more than just Brittany. You know, that's the goal. <laughs> I think oh, you are already. Um, it, it's night and day. You know, what's happened since last June is unbelievable, the change. And almost every day I'm getting contacts from media, uh, from academics, just people wanting to talk about what is, what's really going on? What's this really all about? You know, yeah. that was not happening two years ago.
Well, we've also been very successful in getting specific judges removed from probate yes. court. And the new judge that comes in is a lot more due process oriented. The shift on those counties has been unbelievable. There's some counties like Monterey that we have a uphill battle on, but you know, you know, we're making oh, it, it, it. Monterey changed. It changed. It changed, but it's still bad. Um, Placer County is looking pretty good right at the moment. Placer you know? County, we just got a judge replaced. There was a judge who was putting people into conservatorships and then never having review hearings. Just what? Yeah. Yep. No review hearing. You're like, wow. signs off the conservatorship, no review hearing. I think you found wow. one 10 years, no review hearing. We went back to 2006 and starting the judge that's in there was in there until he got removed, um, came in and I think it was 11, September of mm -hmm. 11. And from that point on, no more review hearings happened yeah. for anybody. The only way they had review hearings is, is that if they wanted money. If, if somebody came in petitioning for money, then they would have a hearing on that. But those, that review hearing you're supposed to have where the court just you know, looks at the case and has people come in and what are you doing? Is everything okay? They just weren't doing those. They simply didn't happen. And the judge is gone now? Oh, he's, 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 in, he's in, in, in uh, a different he jurisdiction. He got moved to... Well, family court, I think. Yeah, that's right. Family court in that case. And the judge who's in there now seems to actually be following the probate code. Good for him. And someone wants to terminate. Okay, how long, many days do you think mm -hmm. the trial will be? And, you know. And we'll still be watching, by the way, just in case he's yeah. wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I had no doubt about that. <laughs> in fact, that's a, that's a bill that's on the agenda for next year is to resume zoom meetings in probate cases and all frankly all civil cases but we care about yep. probate because in placer county as soon as the lockdown was over they cut off zoom yeah now, fortunately we know people up there who can go to the court and watch when hearings are happening but having it on zoom was just fantastic yeah. for advocates yeah. there were times when i would watch three different hearings in a day and that wouldn't yeah. have been physically possible I know. Yeah, I've listened to a lot too, aside from just Brittany's case. But even in Brittany, in LA County, they ended the remote audio program and uh, because COVID numbers were going down. But really, I think it's because someone recorded Brittany's testimony. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but very grateful to have her testimony recorded and shared around the world because I think it's made a huge impact. So, absolutely. Well, thank you guys for your time today. Really thank appreciate you, both of you.